you received a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree with a concentration in acting from Elon University in 2009. Following his undergraduate studies, he then pursued a successful career as an actor and director in New York and served as the executive director of the Daring Field Repertory Theater in New Hampshire for four years. Seven years ago, he moved to Texas to complete his graduate work at Texas Tech University and received his Master's in Fine Arts in Arts Administration. In 2016, he began working with Texans for the Arts. He has served in just about every role at the organization, but most recently served as TFA's Associate Director prior to taking on the role of Executive Director. He has been involved in Texas politics for years and spent time while studying at Texas Tech interning for former <coughs> Congressman Gene Green, who I knew him from Houston, yep. uh, immersing <coughs> himself in arts policy, education, and funding issues. He also spent three years working for Austin nonprofit Creative Action as a Spark School Arts Integration Teaching Artist. In partnership with Austin ISD, he collaborated with classroom teachers to explore non-art subjects and develop curriculum through a creative lens. He is still passionate about the importance of arts education and believes that creativity unlocks many of the most important skills our students can have as they enter the 21st century economy. Let's give a big toss of welcome to Chris Kiley. It's always so strange when I hear people read my bio because those, those other parts of my life seem like a million years ago at this point. But I indeed was a practicing artist for many years before finding this work. And I never imagined I would end up in the advocacy sphere. But uh, my first week of graduate school at Texas Tech, I met my former boss, Ann, who many of you know. Um, and I was at a workshop in Lubbock. And I knew that day that this was something that I wanted to do. Um, I thought it was very important. Growing up in New Hampshire, I had an affinity for politics. I think I met every presidential candidate from the early 90s until 2000, um, because they all stopped at the same diner in my hometown. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I really love this work, and I'm really excited to talk a little bit with you today about Texans for the Arts. Um, just a quick straw poll, because I don't want to bore everyone. Is anyone really familiar with our work, or is this really like a clean slate? Some of us are. Great, okay. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, what Texans for the Arts is, what our mission is, and what we do. And then I had this beautiful slide presentation about how we do that work, which I'll just have, I feel so bad, I'm gonna be going back and forth, but we'll make it work. Um, how we do that work. And then I'd like to end the day talking a little bit about how much our organization in the past has worked with Tasso, and we highly respect the work that you do, and opportunities for us to collaborate together. So um, we'll just sort of begin with the, the organization itself, Texans for the Arts. Our mission at Texans for the Arts is to cultivate an unwavering public commitment to the arts here in Texas. We adopted a new strategic plan about two years ago where that mission, that mission statement has changed. When our organization was founded, we were really solely interested in public resources for the arts and money. And uh, ultimately, as the work and our body of work evolved, we identified this concept of public commitment, and public commitment has more to do than just resources. It's also building um, an understanding and an ecosystem here in the state where everybody views the arts as essential to our lives. That's sort of our vision of what that means. We firmly believe that the arts, they are not a hobby, they are not an expense, they are an asset. And I think that that is a point of view that many people, for whatever reason, have a hard time understanding, so we work really hard to collate and share data, stories, case studies of not only the benefits to the community it provides in terms of quality of life, talent retention, educa education, um, scoring on, on tests, all of that, in addition to the fact that they're a significant economic driver here in the state. You know, um, our, our sector today faces really unprecedented challenges. COVID-19 was devastating for the country, but even more so for many of you who work in the symphonies, you are right there with us, it was more devastating for the arts and culture sector than almost anybody else with the exception of maybe our restaurants and our hoteliers, because we were the very first organizations that had to shut our doors because we gathered inside in large groups, and we were the very last to reopen. 
And that has, and, and on top of that, now that we've come out of the pandemic, we're in a period of higher inflation, people are being careful about how they spend their money. So all of a sudden, resources are becoming more scarce than they ever have been before for the arts and culture industry. Add to that, that we are now also living in a country that I don't think I'm surprising anybody in this room when I say is more divided than perhaps it has ever been since the civil rights movement and the civil war, where we have people really having a difficult time communicating and sharing experiences because we're all very siloed. And I think that has a lot to do with the age of technology and social media and the algorithms that govern our life when we're on the internet. But the arts also have a unique opportunity here because they are transformational in this way. They offer us an opportunity to come together and have shared experiences regardless of our backgrounds, regardless of our political persuasions, regardless of our previous lives, come together and have these experiences together and facilitate difficult conversations in a way that a lot of times we find really difficult. So I think as we think about the challenges we face, I'm also inspired by the opportunities that I think we face here as an industry as well. They improve the lives of our citizens and our communities across the state. They improve our educational outcomes. And they truly are, also in my opinion, at the fundamental core of what we need our students to be uh, learning for all those skills that math and science can teach you. The skills that we'll need in the 21st century, collaboration, creative problem solving. These are things you can't get from anything but the arts. And these aren't really anecdotes. I, I, won't, I had some ideas, some data here, but there is a significant body of research that's been coming out that's been conducted over the last 10 years through Americans for the Arts, who is our national partner. They do a lot of this research. Um, the National Association of State Arts Agencies, like the Texas Commission on the Art, their crew. They do this research, and all of this has been coming to light. Um, the problem is that when I'm talking with lawmakers, they believe that the arts are important. They agree with everything I just said. Fundamentally, with our conservative leaning legislature, they just simply believe that it is not the public's it's not the public sphere's challenge to fund them, that the private sector can fund them. And in some ways, fortunately, some of the arts do have a fairly robust private funding model. I would say that symphony orchestras are an example of an art form that does tend to have access to resources outside of public money, more so than maybe other arts. But I also know that there's probably people in this room who would say that you're dealing with financial struggles as well because of the climate that we live in. Um, but I, I think that that is a fundamentally a flawed tenet, and I'll tell you why. Because I don't think that the private sector, though a critical partner in funding the nonprofit arts world, is by all means capable of doing it on their own, and they shouldn't. A lot of private money comes from foundations and companies. They then, we then put in the hands of those very select people the stewardship of our culture as a state. That is problematic because also foundations tend to be centered in urban areas. Foundations tend to, once they start funding something, they continue to fund that thing, which is great for many of those arts that do get that, but it leaves many behind. Rural communities, for example, are incredibly underfunded by foundation money just because they don't have as many foundations in their area, there's not as many people in their area, and oftentimes foundations feel more comfortable giving to larger institutions because of the history of that organization. When you have these rural startup youth orchestras or youth symphonies, that's really hard to find money for if you're in a community that doesn't have access to those resources. The, the idea of public money for the arts ensures that we all have access in some form or fashion to that. The TCA, for example, the Texas Commission on the Arts, they actually ensure that resources, almost every, I'll put it this way, they don't fund every Texas legislative district, but that's because some of our very uh, rural districts, our friends don't have arts organizations. They just, they don't, they don't really exist. So every, org, every district that does apply for a TCA grant will get money in some form or fashion, and they fund over 85% of the state in places that other, that other private foundations and corporations don't tend to reach. And I do think that's really important because as we look to the, as our lieutenant governor, for example, talks about the importance of circling back to our rural communities and making sure that they're not left behind as we move forward, these public resources become pivotal to ensuring ac equitable access to the arts for every Texan. 
So public investment, um, I think I already said that part. Um, we are also, let me say this, we are woefully behind when it comes to public investment in the arts in Texas. We have been as low as 49th out of 50 states for our resourcing. In the eight years that I've been at Texans for the Arts, we've seen that climb up. We are now, we juggle between 42nd and 45th, depending on what some of these crazy states do in their, in their states to their arts funding. But nonetheless, we have a long way to go. And, and I'll share some examples of, of just sort of the magnitude of that um, and the implications of that compared to some of the other states in just a minute here. So the progress that we're making is not linear. We have, at, at, again, the, the, the work of Texans for the Arts, we do largely work in the legislative space. We also work in the education space. We have a 501c3, which is our education arm. That's what's hosting for those of you joining us at our Texas Arts Advocacy Summit in Waco on Thursday. That is our education arm where we, we, we put all of that energy. And then we have our C4, which is Texans for the Arts, which is our lobbying arm. And that is where we fight for, through the appropriations process, resources for the Texas Commission on the Arts. That's also where we fight to protect, um, <laughs> this isn't getting in the weeds, but it's really important for those of you who understand the municipal hotel tax that's collected in your cities. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We are an allowable use for that tax. The arts has access to those monies if the cities choose to do so. There are only nine uses for that tax right now. We are faced with some people right now who are trying to expand the allowable uses for that money to include things like infrastructure. And think about in some of our communities, if we had a way to not have to use our general revenue on our sewage system, and we could use hotel taxes, how quickly would the arts be gutted? We've already seen people try to do it. Our job is to make sure they don't do it. We do have a great partnership, and I'll talk about our partnerships in a minute, but we work very closely with the Texas Hotel Lodging Association to make sure that doesn't happen. I'll tell you, the hoteliers don't want to be paying for the roads when nobody else is paying for them either. So we have a really good coalition built there. Um, so that's a little bit of who we are and what we do and why we do it. And um, we are a membership organization. I did leave some membership forms here for those of you who maybe are not members and would like to be. I also left a little bit of literature here, a little one-pager about our, our what we do. Um, but now I would like to talk a little bit about how we do this work and where TASO might come into this. So as I mentioned, we have our C3 and our C4. In our C3, we have some major programs. One is our regional conversation series. Our regional conversation series is where I or my team, we travel around the state and we host um, symposiums or gatherings of cultural leaders to take on a specific issue that is impacting the arts. Our most recent one we did in February was in Rockport, Texas. And we did a symposium on the challenges of the 21st century uh, technological landscape and its impact on the arts. I.e., what is AI going to do to our artists? Do we need to be worried? And, if, and the answer is obviously yes. But what do we do about that? That's what we really focused our energy on. We had a conversation about, um, you know, is, are there, is there technology out there to protect our artists? Right now, there's just not a lot of legal or technological protection. So we were talking about that, educating folks, um, and it actually fueled a panel that we'll be having on Thursday where we're bringing in an intellectual property lawyer to talk a little bit about the future of the law as well. So as you can see, from an organization that about 10 years ago was focused really just on hotel taxes and the TCA, we're really broadening our mission to serve the arts community as a whole, individual artists, our musicians. Um, and also I would say AI is not a threat just to our individual artists. Um, imagine for those of you, the symphonies you represent, if you have original work and there's a video of it on Vimeo or YouTube, guarantee you someone can take your original work, pirate it, and make something that looks and feels very much like it and give you no credit. And so we're working on finding ways through policy, technology, and law to combat that. And that issue is something that we're taking on because it has become important to the field. It is important. And my vision for the organization is that we have to be responsive and agile to respond to the needs of our constituents. And all of you as members of the arts community and representing musicians and symphonies fall under that umbrella. Um, so that's what our regional conversation series is. Then we have our summits. We used to do them biennially um, in Austin, which we still do. And that is during the session we come together for a day full of advocacy training, 
um, community, and then we at Texans for the Arts help schedule legislative visits for advocates, whether they're first-time advocates or seasoned advocates, to meet with their elected officials to promote our, legis our shared legislative agenda that we adopt for the field. We've decided now to add, for example, the one in Waco is the interim year one. We found that what was really most important and lacking is if we weren't convening in the interim, the relationships were not being stewarded that are so important. If we start knocking on doors in January to our elected officials, it's too late. They're busy. Right from January 8th, they are looking at the budget, they are looking at all of these other bills and issues. They, we don't have time to get to know them at that point. So this summit is more geared on how do we build those relationships? What should we be doing right now to be prepared for January? Uh, which is really exciting and I'm thrilled that we're doing it. And Waco has been wonderful to host us. Um, another program that we have, we just launched called our Local Engagement Advocacy Director Program or LEAD program. Our goal is to provide uh, the next level of advocacy training for people who are really excited to do this work and to have a seasoned arts advocate in all 181 legislative districts, all 150 of our, our reps and all 31 of our senators, so that when that time comes, no matter who the point person is making a key decision, we've got somebody who can call up and advocate on behalf of the arts and culture sector. Um, and if any of y'all are interested in that, uh, when, I, when I leave today, we'll, I have my website up here, but we have links to all of this, please consider becoming a lead. We are still filling out those, those seats. If you can leverage relationships with your elected officials or are excited to do so, we are happy to help provide training, resources, and community around that. Um, and I think, I don't think I'm missing anything. Uh, other than, oh my gosh, our hot toolkit. Um, as we were talking about the municipal hot tax, the Houston Endowment generously funded an online tool called the Hot Toolkit. So if you're in a community and you're a symphony or the people you represent are trying to access those hotel dollars, we have a whole online toolkit that you can use from beginning from, I don't even know if my community collects hot taxes, to I'm trying to go from 13 to 15% for the arts. So there's, there's this large swath of different places people come to the work and the Hot Toolkit, you can jump in wherever you are and then go as far as you wanna go with it. So that is a very broad body of work that we have that covers a lot of bases. Um, I'm certainly happy to take some questions, but I, I did wanna mention that we are an organization that I see as a connecting organization. Um, we work with organizations like TASO. We work with organizations like Texas Hotel Logic, Texas Association of Museums. Um, with other arts and culture leaders to come together so that we're all speaking with one collective voice because the strong, the more we speak with one voice, the more the ranks of TFA, the more the ranks of TASA, the more we grow our membership, the more important our voice becomes in a room that is filled with a lot of noise, especially right now. Um, and then we also have corporate partners. We work very closely, as I mentioned, the whole conversation about artificial intelligence. We partner with Orion Chain Labs, which is an AI model um, company out of New York that is building this technology and actively designing it, who has, worked, who has decided that they want to be a vanguard for uh, protecting artists, doing the right thing, and building their technology around making it accessible, giving the opportunities to the artists, but protecting their rights to their creative lives and intellectual property. So we work very closely with them to work on policy, we, they, they, um, they beta test technology on our artists, it's a really productive relationship, and that's how we kind of bridge the corporate community. Um, and then lastly, we also have some of our other intergovernmental partners like the Texas Commission on the Arts, the Texas Cultural Trust, for those of you who are familiar, and the, um, our national partners out of Americans for the Arts. So we, we work in a lot of spaces, um, and we try to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So that's, that's fundamentally what we do and, and how we do it. Um, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything too bad. I, I didn't want to keep looking back, so I just went for it. <laughs> but I think I did pretty good. <laughs> um, oh, I was just going to go over, uh, we as an organization also put out a legislative agenda on behalf of the field. Um, we work closely with the Texas Commission on the Arts, the Trust, our membership, who it represents over 300 organizations from every corner of the state, to come together around something that we endorse as our agenda. In the 88th session, during the last session, we had endorsed um, the, the um, it was six, no, 
those, five and three. Five million for the TCA's cultural district program grants, and three million for their organizational grants. We haven't formally adopted one, that's what we'll be doing over the next week um, in preparation for the session, but I can tell you that the Texas Commission on the Arts just recently put out their legislative appropriation requests or their exceptional items, so in the, in the appropriations process, that is really what the Appropriations Committee will look to as to whether or not they'll grow the budget of the TCA. They're asking for $9 million for arts organizations and $2 million for cultural districts because the, we, we as an organization went to the TCA and said, you have, you're only able to meet about 11% of the funding requests from your organizations and you're able to meet about 70% of your requests from cultural district organizations. We need to get more money in the hands of those people who don't happen to have a cultural district. Now, obviously that's not to say we don't, we're not working towards it. In fact, if we get the two million for cultural districts, they'll be able to fund it 97% of all applications for cultural district grants. So we work very closely. So that will be part of our legislative agenda. And then of course, we will be combating what we already see emerging as a threat to the municipal hot tax and its allowable uses. Um, the president of my board testified at a subcommittee hearing a couple of weeks ago, and some shocking people, people I would never have expected, came forward in favor of expanding those allowable uses. So we'll be working actively to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, I think, I, I'm happy to take some questions. I think it's, I don't want to stand up here and just talk all day. I, I know there's a lot. Um, the last point I'd like to make is, is, in these conversations, why advocacy is so important. A lot of people say, I don't really know if I understand advocacy. Maybe there's a little apprehension about getting involved. Um, but we know that this work is important. And, and, and if we don't, it's, it's a fundamental threat to our industry if we don't do this work. Um, I don't know if you all saw, but in Florida last week, Governor Ron DeSantis vetoed all public arts funding in the state of Florida. $32 million. And we only have $16 million at the TCA. So when you think about a budget the size of Texas, which is much bigger than Florida, it would be very easy for Governor Abbott to redline our budget without blinking an eye, because it's half the size of the budget in Florida that Ron DeSantis had no trouble vetoing. So it's very, very important that we do get out there and say, you won't do that to us, here's why. We need to be out there case building for why the arts are so valuable to our economies and to our communities. How is he able to do that? I mean, are you saying that they don't have the, the, the right advocacy groups um, in that state? Like, like, what is his platform and reasoning for doing that? And how do you <laughs> know that ahead of time to know how to come back? Well, to be honest with you, I I don't I don't know what Ron DeSantis is thinking. I, mean, just, I, mean, I don't live in Florida. I, I don't mean, mean like that. I mean, in general, like, you know, but it, in, 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 is it the same sort of rhetoric uh, across the board, do you think? It is, so I think what it came down to, uh, the other case I was going to mention was in Arizona. They cut their funding by 60%, but they were operating in deficit. So that I understand. Yeah. Florida, and te Texas, by the way, has billions of dollars in a rainy day fund. We are not in any chance, we're not going broke anytime soon here in Texas. We have the money. And... So I think what it comes down to is that there is a perception of the arts as being part of this, this woke culture war culture mm -hmm. where I think political expediency does sometimes fuel decisions like this. But to be honest with you, based on what I've read in the papers, I don't think Governor DeSantis really thought people were paying attention. Gotcha. Um, they do have an advocacy organization. Advocacy organizations often, we have often, <laughs> The challenge for us is that I don't have a product like a symphony. People can't come and see my concerts. Mm -hmm. People have to fundamentally buy in to the message that I'm sharing today, that it is up to us to be a, a collective voice and we steward that voice. In Florida, they were having trouble with getting people to participate in their advocacy efforts. We fortunately in Texas don't have as much of that problem. Uh, we're very active, we're out there. It's my goal, I try to be all over the state. Uh, I've been to El Paso, Granbury, Rockport, Houston, Dallas, all these places just since taking over this role in November. And I think it's important that I do make time to speak with groups like yours because I, I think it helps, it helps frame the issue. What I will say is that the structure of Florida's budget is the same as Texas. 
So Ron DeSantis has what's called veto power, red line veto power. So for a certain period of time after a budget is passed, he can just cross things off the budget that he doesn't think should be funded. And in Texas, Governor Abbott also has that privilege for 40 days after the legislature. Do you ever go into the rules and sort of, I'm sorry. No, no, please. Um, in terms of like uh, looking at statistics and how the fine arts, uh, you know, because you're talking about you know, recidivism, you know, going all the way back to like, what is sort of the leading cause of kids dropping out, uh, getting into trouble, getting yeah. into prison. And we actually know that kids do less of that when they engage in the arts. That's my there point. Is data. So that, I, I, I would imagine. Yeah. So being able to look like, Present that, run on that, are there some sort of things that you do? We do. So we, we don't conduct that research. We rely on our partners. The Texas Cultural Trust invests heavily in something called the State of the Arts Report every two years. It is invaluable. They conduct the research, we take that research, and we run with it. It's part of the great partnership that we have with that organization. That uh, State of the Arts Report was released last year, and it will be released again in February. Yeah. Um, so that's available online, and that has, those are robust research around kids graduate more, they go to college more, they stay out of trouble, they get better grades, they score higher on tests, people stay in hospitals shorter periods of time, they're on less medications, um, it helps veterans, the opioid crisis for our veterans community is rampant because when they come back and they're suffering from PTSD, they get put on these medications that get them addicted. We, we advocate for you know, mask work, putting something in front of them and using the arts as a tool to deal with their PTSD. The arts generated $380 million in just Texas sales tax. Not to mention all the periphery, all the other economic driving forces, like the, the trickle down economics in terms of people going to restaurants or people paying local taxes, just state tax revenue. It was you know, 200, 300 times what our budget is for the TCA. It's a really good return on investment. So that data is out there, and that is part of what we do at our advocacy okay. summits, is take that data, make it real, so to speak. We offer case studies where people will use their personal stories. Um, so we have all of that data available to you if you ever have a, if you ever have a specific question here at TASO, I need, I need a number that's gonna help me with this thing. If you come to us, I'm sure we can help you find that data, or we can direct you to the person that will have it. The other thing that gets me up every day with my background as a theater person is I think the most compelling part of advocacy is when we tell our stories. I have a story about when I was at a Spark School, arts integration specialist, I was in an underserved community in East Austin. And I partnered with a classroom teacher. In fifth grade, there's the dreaded star science test. Okay. The educators in the room. It is, it is, these kids are terrified of it. It's the hardest star test, or so they say. I never took a star test. Um, her classroom was failing at 67% of her students at mid-year were failing. I came in and we applied arts, arts and creative activities to the science curriculum, not teaching to the test, and we passed 100% of my students. That is a compelling story, and I get goosebumps because I love telling it. And then I can talk about, by the way, in the SOTAR they say, this is not just a Chris story, this is true across the board. Here's the data to back up, but never underestimate what they'll remember is the story. Senator Jane Nelson one time, I went in, uh, we had a person coming up from Houston to testify, and they got, I don't think they got in a car accident, but they were in like around an accident, they weren't gonna make it to the Capitol. I was teaching, and I was teaching a painting class at in East Austin. I came over in my jeans, my Creative Action t-shirt, covered in paint, and I, I went before the Senate Finance Committee and I said, I'm so sorry, but I was actually out there in the field doing this work and was called in to testify because someone couldn't be here. That will stick with the legislator <laughs> forever. They'll never forget you. And if you're just compared to some of our friends, they take pride. Their national identity, who they, how they feel as a German is tied up in the arts that they consume. Yeah. And they, all of those Western, other Western civilizations have a czar of culture, a cabinet level position dedicated to arts and culture. And we only have the head of the NEA, which is one of the smallest agencies in Washington. That's the highest arts official we have. And that, I think, is a tragedy. So that is hopefully something that will change over time. We're a young nation, we don't have all that, you know, we don't have quite the same length of history to like, take that pride in and own. But I also think that that is what makes us special and we should own that, but we should definitely have uh, more representation, but I, I think 
You're, you're absolutely right about that, that by investing, the return on investment is, depending on whose figures you use, anywhere between one, on the low end, one and six. So for every dollar, you get six back to your community, or to up to 13 for every dollar, you're bringing in 13, you know, depends on how they measure those dollars. But nonetheless, if you were investing your money in something, and I'll give you six dollars for every dollar you give me, I would give them all my money. <laughs> exactly. I don't understand that. So, and I think they are, they can understand it, and they will understand it, but as I've mentioned before, it's going to take all of us and all of our organizations, right? It's not just us. It's also, we're working really hard to reach the individual artist community. Historically, we've been an organization that has largely represented nonprofit arts groups, organizations, so we're finding ways, for example, the AI conversation to bridge that gap with our individual artists in the state as well, which are truly our bedrock, right? They're our foundation. Without them, none of us can do anything. Yes, ma'am. Is there any connection between what TCA is doing and with, you know, the Texas Education Agency? Because some of the biggest cuts are in our public schools as far as music and arts, and it's always the first to go. And so I, you know, certainly <coughs> clear on the advocacy you're talking about here today with TAC and, and other things. But is there any kind of partnership that's developing between y'all, or is it just complicated? You know, historically, we haven't really gotten into the public education sphere, largely because of bandwidth. Um, I was an arts educator, right? There's nothing I would love more to enter that for it. But for those of you in that sphere, you know how complicated it is. And there's, there's a lot of teams, and there's a lot of stuff. So we have not historically gotten as involved in that, other than making sure that our legislators understand the implicit value by the numbers of making sure those programs exist. Um, we're always ready to partner uh, and, and forge new partnerships, right? We're always willing to have that conversation, but I don't think that the, the, the place in the state's budget where the TCA money comes from is not the same place where the education money comes from. So we're lobbying over different articles of the budget. Yes, ma'am? What percentage of um, the budget is in Invested in the arts. Uh, I, I I don't know, but I can tell you probably a pebble of sand on a beach. Yeah. I mean, I think our budget's like sixteen billion, and we fund sixteen million for the arts. I mean, yeah, because I'm trying to think. I mean, it's obviously as as all of I mean, in your own household, everybody's got all these incoming d demands on our income, mm -hmm. and so it's a matter really of convincing as you're trying to do. The people making those decisions that it's important to fund that but but if you fund that what would you take out because it's sort of one of those things I'm sure in a lot of their minds it may not be true but I yeah people are, are juggling things I think that there are times in which that is true that conversation gets trickier the last thing I ever want to do is tell the government to take money away from you know taking care of children or feeding hungry people right yeah. that's not but what I will say is that right now our state has more money in its coffers than it has right. ever had in the history of the state. We are sitting, we had so much money, they had to do that property tax uh, special session because our rainy day fund legally was too full. They couldn't put any more money in it. So right now the resources are there. Um, and, I, and I do, I feel like to your point, I feel for my friends in Arizona because I don't really know how to, I don't know what to tell them. Everyone was getting cuts but the arts got hit extra hard. That's a hard thing to sell unless you have a champion, right? We're very fortunate in Representative Mary Gonzalez, who we appreciate Tasso honoring. We are also getting ready to honor her. She serves on the Article 1, um, which is where the Texas Commission on the Arts budget is in the appropriations process. And she fought tooth and nail to make sure we got those resources. So particularly now, building those relationships, when you do get feast or famine and you start to shift towards a famine, you want to make sure that you have those decision makers already bought in and ready to work with you. Um, and that's really what our goal is right now. How much is the hotel occupancy tax? So the hotel tax, um, it varies. So there is a 6% state tax that is taken right off the bat. No cities see any of it. The arts don't see any of it. 6% of your host, hotel stay goes right to the state government and to the state coffers. Then cities can choose to levy an additional tax. They, they, they range, I think Austin's really one of the highest. I think they do, they do like a 13% just because of the amount of tourism that they have. And, a lot. and Austin is a city also, we welcome a lot of out-of-state visitors 
and, the, and Austinites, we work so hard because we also have a lot of other city taxes. We want to make sure that people who are coming to use our facilities and enjoy our city are paying for the privilege. But then you also, they range in motion. I would say the average municipal hot tax is 7 to 8%, okay. or 6 to 8%. On the hotel fees. Yes. So you'll get your hotel bill. Yeah. There's a 6% tax on the room, goes to the state. There's probably another 6 or 7%. That's a city, a municipally levied tax. Counties in rural, rural communities can also levy such a tax. And then you take that 7%. And we at Texas for the Arts advocate for using up to 15% of that piece for the arts. If we did that, we estimate that there would be approximately $170 million if every community in the state of Texas was at 15% of their municipal tax for the arts going back into the field. That's not where we are today. Some don't levy any, and, if, and some that do don't get any to the arts. Because again, it's up to the city what they want to do within that tax code of, of nine, now nine allowable uses, uh, what they want to do with those resources. Now, some rare communities actually take more. I believe Rockport does 33%, but you have to, it gets complicated because of our relationship with the lodging industry. They don't want to see that much money go back to the arts because there are other things that fuel tourism they want to see funded too. But Rockport in particular, because it is an artist colony, and because they have one of the largest arts festivals in the region that bring in a ton of money, they felt they wanted to use more, and they do. Um, we applaud them for that, but we don't advocate for that because of our MOU with Texas Hotel Lodging. Any more questions? Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned before, Thursday, for those of you in the area here, Thursday we'll be in Waco at the Cambria Hotel. There's still there's still time to register if you want to join us and learn more about this amazing work. Uh, again, I've left behind a little literature about who we are, what we do, and, an, and a, there's a paper membership form, but then you can also always just go to our website and become a member too. We have organizational memberships and individual memberships, and uh, I just encourage you to join this movement because together we can accomplish great things. Thank you. Oh, yes. Right. The best speakers are those who don't even use a slideshow. So, oops, congratulations. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, and the, oh, the one thing I totally forgot was how we can work with Tasso. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about that real quick before I go. Um, Y'all have historically worked with us as you've selected your Legislator of the Year Award. We absolutely welcome that and appreciate the honor of doing that with you. We also now are about to start awarding the Legislator of the Year for um, their advocacy efforts. And I think it's a great opportunity because now with both of these awards, we can cast a wider net for those we appreciate. So we, we absolutely appreciate that. Um, the other thing I would tell your, your, you know, your other members of your guilds and your symphonies, just make sure you're inviting elected officials to stuff. Again, touring a prison is one thing. Going to the symphony is another. People want to go to the symphony, you know? Um, so I think that is a great way to get um, involved with us. Come join us at our summits. And then if you ever want to have us come and do an advocacy training at any of your group meetings, other than, you know, this was kind of a, a meet and greet, but we do formal advocacy training, and I'm happy to join you anywhere in the state that my schedule allows. So uh, if you have other ideas as you're talking as a group, things you want to explore with us, uh, my email is very simple. It's just chris at texansforthearts.com. Never hesitate to reach out. I look forward to hearing from all of you and, and working together. So thank you. Thank you very much.